We don't all have to agree with every tenet of an ideology or belief system in order to adopt some of its principles, or at least to understand the principles. We just think it's important for people to keep an open mind and take in as much as they can. And as discontent with the establishment political parties grows in the United States, we see growing interest in alternative frameworks and ideologies. And one example would be libertarianism, for example. And with this come different economic theories, too. So on that note, join me now from our New York studio to talk about some of those libertarian and Austrian ideas is Walter Block, chair of economics at Loyola University, New Orleans, and author of Defending the Undefendable. There's one of his books right there. And uh, Mr. Block, Walter Block, uh, professor, I should say, actually, uh, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me on your show. It's a pleasure to be with you. It's a pleasure to have you because, you know, I think a lot of our audience would probably have a, an idea in their head of, of what they consider libertarianism to be whether they are libertarian or not. But, but I think that as we've seen a growth in that movement, we've seen people like Ron Paul, who uh, is touted as a libertarian, but was you know, trying, trying to run for president under the Republican uh, ticket. There, there may be a lot of confusion, a lot of misconceptions about what it means to be libertarian. So just, I'm gonna throw it out there. What is a libertarian? Well, a libertarian is neither left nor right. A libertarian is something sui generis or unique or very different than the left-right spectrum. Uh, libertarians agree with uh, leftists, for example, on legalizing drugs and agree with rightists on, um, I don't know, private property and free enterprise. So we're neither fish nor fowl. The way I see the political economic map, it's like a three-legged stool. There's conservatives here, liberals there. Uh, right-wingers with the conservatives, progressive liberals, and then there are libertarians, and we are very different both of the others, and we are just as far apart from either of them as we are from each other, so it's really a three-legged stool. So what is libertarianism, now that I've said where it is and where it isn't? Uh, libertarianism is based on two axioms, or two sides of the same coin. One of the uh, sides of the coin is the non-aggression principle, namely, keep your mitts to yourself, don't grab other people, without their permission, don't grab their property, uh, just uh, be cool and uh, don't invade or aggress, no murder, rape, theft, or any of that stuff. And the second one is private property rights, because in order to determine whether something is theft or not, we have to have a theory as to who owns the thing in the first place. Mm -hmm. So our theory, the libertarian theory, if I can speak for that, and you know, you get 10 libertarians in a room, you'll get 11 different opinions, but <laughs> I think there's consensus on this. Okay. And that is, it stems from John Locke and Murray Rothbard homesteading. Mm -hmm. The way you get to own natural resources or uh, virgin territories, you mix your labor with the land and then you get to own it after a while. Well, and what are the other legitimate uh, ways of owning things? Well, given uh, that we uh, first homestead stuff and, and now turn nature or virgin territory into own territory, other legitimate title transfers are trade, barter, gifts, gambling, anything peaceable uh, mm -hmm. where uh, property transfers from one person to another. Now, as I've explained it, I think most people would say, yeah, we're libertarians. I mean, uh, it's pretty uncivilized and barbaric to advocate uh, uh, rape or murder or, or theft or anything like that. But the difference between libertarians and the ordinary folk who would accept this, and, and, and this is just the, uh, the criteria of, uh, of civilization or non-barbarism, the difference between libertarians and other people who might give lip service to this on a superficial level is that we really mean it. Mm -hmm. And we apply it to everything, and we make no exceptions for it. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, uh, take uh, drug legalization. Uh, suppose I'm stupid enough to take uh, heroin or marijuana or whatever. Mm -hmm. Have I, per se, I invaded anyone else's territory or property? No. So okay. it, should be, it should be legal. Uh, similarly, with uh, uh, take the minimum wage law. Suppose I make a deal with somebody to pay him $3 an hour, and he agrees, and he's an adult. Mm -hmm. Have I violated anyone's rights? Have I been guilty of an invasive act on, mm -hmm. uh, with regard to anyone? No. Right. Therefore, the minimum wage law, forgetting about its effect, which is an economic issue, right. 
But just from a libertarian point of view, the minimum wage law should be uh, abolished, mm -hmm. which would put me as a right winger and, and legalizing drugs as a left winger. So as I say, libertarians are unique. We're sui generis. We're different than all the other political philosophies. Mm -hmm. But we adhere rigidly to this idea of non-invasion, uh, non-aggression. Okay. And then you mentioned minimum wage laws. And this, of course, ties into economics. So I want to know because many people associate libertarianism with Austrian economics. Do you have to be uh, a libertarian to be an Austrian uh, economist or to subscribe to those principles? Do you have to be an Austrian to be a libertarian? Or can you be one without being the other? How do they relate or, or differ? Yeah. The two are totally different. Mm -hmm. uh, libertarianism is a theory as to what should be. It's a normative theory. It says what's right and what's wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, Austrian economics, as a branch of economics or as a better uh, school of economics, uh, has nothing to do with what should be. It's rather uh, what causes what. Mm -hmm. So when I say that the minimum wage law should be uh, repealed, I'm speaking as a libertarian because I'm talking about what should and should not be. Mm -hmm. But if I were to talk about what are the effects of a minimum wage law, namely it, it creates unemployment for unskilled workers, a lot of people think the minimum wage law is a law under wages, and the higher it is, the higher wages go. But the truth of the matter is that minimum wage law is more like a barrier. And the higher it is, the harder it is to jump over. And if it gets real high, it's very hard to get a job. So that would be an economic thing. So one could be an Austrian economist or an economist. Uh, and I think most economists would agree with that uh, without being a libertarian. For example, you could say, it's a little weird, but you could say, look, the minimum wage law will create unemployment for unskilled workers, particularly blacks or other unskilled workers, but I hate them, and therefore I favor the minimum wage because I want them to be unemployed. Uh, so I would be a bad libertarian, but a good Austrian economist or a good economist. Mm -hmm. So the two are subtly different, but very importantly different. One is a positive thing. Uh, uh, it's a descriptive. It explains reality. The other is a normative. It's prescriptive. It says what should be and what shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. but, but the fact that the two seem to go so hand in hand, is that just because many of the same tenets are, sh are shared or do they go together necessarily speaking? Well, the two people that converted more people to libertarianism than anyone else is Ayn Rand and Ron Paul. Mm -hmm. Ayn Rand with her book Atlas Shrugged, which came out in 1957 and is still selling tons of books. And Ron Paul, who we all know, has uh, he goes to a college campus and he gets uh, 10,000 kids to hear him. Mm -hmm. Both of these people were uh, libertarians. Ayn Rand would reject the label, but she certainly uh, favored uh, virtually all of libertarianism. Mm -hmm. And Ron Paul is a libertarian. So I think that the reason people associate the two in their minds is because mm -hmm. the two people who have converted more people to both, to Austrian economics and to uh, libertarianism, uh, combine both. But it need not be. It's, it's logically possible for one to be a libertarian and not an Austrian, or to be an Austrian and not a libertarian. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, as a matter of fact, there's a high correlation. I think uh, virtually all Austrian economists that I know of nowadays mm -hmm. are libertarians. And uh, of all economists who are libertarians, I would say 90% of them are Austrian economists. Okay, so a lot of crossover there. So now let's get into a few of the debates, because one that we had in our editorial meeting this morning when we were discussing your interview was uh, the issue of the corporation as an individual. We know the Supreme Court ruled essentially that a corporation is a person. Uh, libertarians are defenders of individual rights. So isn't there a conflict inherent in practicing unbridled laissez-faire economics when corporations have the same rights as people? Well, uh, corporations uh, wouldn't be an individual. They'd be a group of uh, stockholders in, in the corporation. And uh, what, what they are is a limited liability corporation. So if you deal with me, let's say I'm Walmart, mm -hmm. uh, and I say uh, that the contract is such that if you have any problem with me, you can sue me, but you're only uh, able to get the money that's in the corporate till. You can't come after my private fortune. And if you don't want to deal with me, then don't deal with me. So I think it's just a, a contract. I don't think it's a special privilege. I think corporations are perfectly uh, compatible with the libertarian ethic. Look, uh, suppose you and I uh, form a corporation, mm -hmm. and now we sell groceries to people, and we put a little sign up on, on the top of our store and says, if you deal with us, we're a limited liability corporation. You can only sue us for, for the amount of money that we've got in, in our uh, 
in our corporate uh, till. And, and if you don't like it, go to someone who isn't a corporation, and then you can sue them for all the money that they have in their personal fortunes. So I don't see any incompatibility uh, between making this sort of a contract with people, and that's all what a, uh, that a corporation is. Uh, a corporation doesn't have any special privileges. It's just a, a certain contract. And, and contracts between consenting adults or capitalist acts between consenting adults are certainly compatible with, um, with libertarianism. But the way corporations are today in the United States, is that not how you would see corporations as being treated? Well, there are two kinds of corporations, good mm -hmm. corporations and bad corporations. Mm -hmm. And there are two kinds of people, good people and bad people. Right. And the good people are those who, surprise, surprise, adhere to the non-aggression principle. And the others are the ones who don't. And the good ones I call uh, adherents of laissez-faire capitalism. And the other ones I call adherents of crony capitalism, mm -hmm. bailouts, uh, getting money for Detroit, getting money for Wall Street, getting money for, you know, you're too big to fail, so we give you, we shove taxpayer money down your throat. Now, mm -hmm. I, I don't single out corporations. If the government bails out an individual, that would be improper. That would be a crony individual. Mm -hmm. And I don't make any real big distinction between a crony corporation and a crony individual. I put them both on the crony side. And then I don't make any difference between a, a good capitalist uh, corporation and a good capitalist individual. I put them both on the good side. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the dividing line is between crony and laissez-faire, not between corporations and individuals. I think it's a false dichotomy uh, to look at the individuals versus the corporations. Walter Block, we are going to hear so much more about this after the break, about sinking and swimming and the crony capitalists. Walter Block, author and chair of economics at Loyola University, New Orleans. Welcome back. I don't want to waste any time. I want to go straight back to our guest who's talking to us today about libertarianism and Austrian economics. He is a representative of both. He's Walter Block, chair of economics at Loyola University, New Orleans, uh, also an author. And I want to get straight back to this because you mentioned too big to fail. You mentioned bailouts. Let's talk about GM because today there's a story out that just reminded me of how screwed up things are. You have GM bailed out $50 billion by taxpayers. Now they're getting sick of being called uh, government motors. They're being sick of uh, dealing with not being able to fly in their corporate jets or having pay restrictions. So they want to buy back some of those shares from the government. But in doing so, it would amount to, if they bought back all the shares at this price, a $15 billion loss for taxpayers. So my question to you, I know you would say you're opposed to bailouts. Is there a libertarian um, Austrian inspired solution to winding down too big to fail and ending corporate welfare, which seems to have to do with the entrenched interests in Washington? Well, as Ron Paul said about Iraq, we just marched in, we can just march out. I say the same thing about bailouts. We just marched in, let's march out. Let's first uh, go cold turkey and not bail out anyone else, and then uh, uh, let those bailed out companies uh, sink or swim. Uh, I, I don't uh, see any reason to bail out anyone uh, in, in the laissez-faire capitalist society, the just society. The only way you make money is by satisfying consumers or getting a better product at a lower price. Uh, but to get a bailout is to take from customers in the form of in their role as taxpayers what they were unwilling to give to you in their role as consumers. Uh, General Motors should have gone broke. Uh, the Chrysler should never have been uh, bailed out years ago, and it never should have been bailed out now. Mm -hmm. And if we drive uh, Japanese cars or Swedish cars, uh, who cares? I mean, we. Uh, I mean, Mozart wasn't an American. We, uh, we listen to Mozart. Uh, what should we do, bail out or give a subsidy to American composers when we have a Mozart? It's, it's very silly. And it's really a, a violation of rights. Mm -hmm. What you're doing is taking money uh, from rich and poor and giving it to rich people who are uh, associated with the, uh, uh, the auto companies, uh, mm -hmm. General Motors and, and others, Chrysler. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a, a shame and a disgrace. And the people who did it ought to be, I don't know, uh, when and if we have a libertarian Nuremberg trial. Now, I'm not saying that they're Nazis, but I'm saying if libertarians ever get into power, mm -hmm. we might look askance at the people who gave the bailouts because that was just taking um, stolen money from taxpayers and giving it to people who never should have gotten the money. And, and if we're serious about no theft, well, we should apply it to when government does it too. And what about with corporate wealth? Is there any kind of workable way to unwind that? Because to me, it seems to be very much uh, related to the entrenched interest in Washington, the, the lobby 
lobbying, the campaign contributions, uh, the bureaucracy that gets built up around these industries and, and that all have a presence in Washington? Well, there are three kinds of welfare. There's corporate welfare, there's domestic welfare to supposedly poor people, and then there's a foreign aid, uh, namely international welfare, and all three are just uh, horrendous things. They, they don't, uh, they're not efficacious in that they don't uh, lead to uh, good conclusions, and they're a violation of rights. Uh, it's, look, if I come up to you with a gun and I say, give me your money, mm -hmm. and, and you protest, you say, well, that's against libertarianism, I say, tut, 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 I'm going to give it to some poor person, it doesn't make it any less theft. Than, uh, and than in any other way. So what, when the government has welfare, whether it's corporate welfare, individual welfare, for ostensibly poor people, or foreign welfare, it's, it's just wrong. Mm -hmm. and, and welfare has very, very deleterious effects. Mm -hmm. uh, what happened, uh, you know, the, there's this experiment, if you throw a frog into boiling water, mm -hmm. It'll jump out. Its metabolism is such that it'll jump out. And if you put um, a frog in a, a cold water and you heat it up gradually, it'll stay there and get, uh, I guess, boiled. Boiled alive. to death. Yeah. Well, well, slavery uh, was like uh, boiling water with regard to the black family. Uh, after the slavery was ended in 1865, the black family was almost as intact as the white family. Uh, all through the 1870s and 1880s, black people were trying to get together. And in the 1910 census, the rate of family formation between whites and blacks was just a teensy bit different, a little bit in favor of whites, but it was pretty good. Then we had welfare, and the black family is... Uh, not only breaking up, but failing to form in the first place. I, th I think the statistic is something like three quarters of the um, uh, black, fa uh, three quarters of black kids are raised in non-intact families, you... and intact families mm -hmm. are very important. Uh, an intact family means that you have less uh, uh, criminality, less drugs, less prostitution, less school leaving, and all sorts of things. And the welfare just undermined uh, the black family. So you're the welfare th that's private. Let's, let's welfare. back up a second. Let's back up a second. So you're suggesting that welfare was the problem in the african-american community because i'm sure there are many people that would very uh, passionately disagree with that and argue that there isn't enough assistance or uh, enough to help for people that have the odds so stacked against them in that regard well you're quite right there are people who would argue against it but i beg to differ uh, mm -hmm. from them the statistics are clear uh... until uh, nineteen sixty five when welfare really got going the black family was uh, pretty intact mm -hmm. but uh, as charles murray in his book losing grounds demonstrates i, I think very well uh... what welfare did is made a young woman who was pregnant a much better offer than uh, the young man who impregnated her uh... in effect she married the state and it's not just a black thing in sweden uh... where they're mostly white people and they have welfare the uh, family is becoming unintact there too so it's not a black white thing it's just a, uh, an indication of the vicious, depraved, and immoral effects of welfare. And yet everyone, so it sounds good, you know, it sounds like motherhood and apple pie. But it, it breaks up families, and, and families are very important for, for the economy. Uh, monetary policy is too, and getting rid of the Fed is also, and getting rid of the minimum wage, and unions are too. But uh, a good family formation is uh, 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 an indication, a precursor to uh, economic welfare as well. So we should get rid of corporate welfare domestic uh, welfare for poor people supposedly and and also foreign aid and and what we should do to help the black family is first of all legalize drugs in terms of african-american community uh, they are disproportionately in jail or dead due to uh, shootings mm -hmm. with each other mm -hmm. Ron Paul is accused of being a racist, and yet he is the only one, uh, not Obama, well, uh, Gary Johnson also now, who mm -hmm. is relevant to the race. Uh, the libertarians are the only ones who are saying we should legalize drugs, and if we did, an awful lot of uh, young black men wouldn't be dead who are now dead, and an awful lot of them would be out of jail because they, all they did was buy and sell stuff, and in buying and selling is part of free enterprise, only they bought and sold uh, marijuana. All right. And then... I'm sorry, Professor Block, we're out of time. I do appreciate oh. you sharing uh, sharing all of your views. I also want to express to our audience that I, I don't want to generalize an entire population or a race in terms of what we're talking about. But um, thank you for bringing up all of those perspectives and sharing them with us today. That was Walter Block, author and chair of economics at Loyola University, New Orleans. Thanks for having me on your show. Thank you.